Hi, this is Dr. Joby. Welcome to the podcast. Today we're going to be looking at early American psychology, functionalism, and William James. In the 1890s, there existed two main paradigms of psychology in the United States. The first was at Cornell University with Edward Titchener, his claim to have brought Wundtian psychology to the United States, Wundtian structuralism, as Titchener called it, uh, was actually Titchener's own structuralism and uh, was quite different than the type of psychology that Wundt was exploring in Germany, that psychology Wundt called voluntarism. But at Harvard University, with people like C.S. Peirce, John Dewey, and William James came a uniquely American psychology called functionalism. And there are some characteristics of functionalism that uh, make it very distinct from the project of both voluntarism in Germany and Titchener's structuralism at Cornell. Here are a few of those distinctive characteristics of functionalism. Functionalists were interested in the why of the mind, not breaking down the mind into distinct elements of consciousness, but rather understanding the mind as it functions for the individual or for the animal within the environment. Functionalism was greatly influenced by evolutionary theory. And so it was looking at the mind and how the mind and the psychology, the psyche functions to aid the, the organism in survival and passing on its genes. Uh, the functionalists opposed what they considered a sterile search for the elements of consciousness. And that's exactly what the structuralist engaged in. So right from the start, we see a major distinction between uh, German structuralism and American functionalism. The functionalists wanted to understand the function of the mind rather than provide a static description of its contents. They believed that mental processes had a function to aid the organism in adapting to the environment. That is, they were interested in the what it was for rather than uh, what it is, its function rather than its structure. The functionalists wanted also psychology to be a practical science, not a pure science, and they sought to apply their findings uh, to the improvement of personal life, education, industry, and so on. The functionalists were committed to developing psychology into a practical, useful thing for education, for industry, for health, mental health. The functionalists urged the broadening of psychology to include research on animals, children, as well as abnormal humans. They also accepted an eclectic methodology from mazes to mental tests. We'll find later that William James introduced the idea of radical empiricism, and this was really the, the foundation of pragmatism, the philosophy of pragmatism, which later greatly influenced functionalism. And that's an almost anything goes in exploration. Don't exclude any methodology or any source of scientia, acquisition of knowledge. It's radical empiricism of the functionalists. This was in contrast to the structuralists and voluntarists' commitment to their experimental method of introspection. It should be noted that the functionalists didn't exclude introspection. However, they didn't limit themselves to introspection. The functionalists were interested in the why. The why of the mental processes and the behavior led directly to a concern with motivation. Because an organism will act differently in the same environment and its needs change, these needs must be understood before the organism's behavior could be understood. And this is an argument and a criticism of contemporary psychology as well. When we look at 
certain psychologies such as cognitive psychology or behaviorism, the motivation is often neglected or oversimplified. And the functionalists, like the evolutionary psychologists of today, the humanists and the psychodynamic psychologists, both em- all emphasize that motivation is not only very di- di- disparate, very diverse, but also quite variable from organism to organism. And a one-size-fits-all uh, motivation for reward or motivation for uh, hunger or sex drive or some sort of drive reduction is far too simplistic to consider as a one-size-fits-all explanation for behavior. The functionalists were strongly committed to understanding and researching not only the behavior but the motivation, the psychological and emotional motivations behind the behavior. The functionalists accepted both mental processes and behavior as legitimate subject matter for psychology, and most of them viewed uh, introspection as one of the many various research tools. And functionalists tended to be more ideographic than nomothetic. Remember, ideographic means looking at individuals, whereas nomothetic means looking at groups for commonalities. Uh, That is, they were more interested in what made organisms different from one another than what made them similar. And all functionalists were directly or indirectly influenced by probably America's second greatest philosopher behind C.S. Peirce, William James. William James has the distinction of having written the first American psychology textbook, Now, this psychology textbook called The Principles of Psychology exists in two volumes. They're both very thick volumes, and they happen to be the two volumes that remain on my desk that I refer to with every question that I have. William James uh, seems to really have had an intuitive sense of getting to the, the, the heart of things, getting to the core of things, and most of, if not all of, that I've read by James uh, in 1890 is entirely relevant in, two, in the 21st century. Uh, there's a smaller version of James's Principles of Psychology. Uh, the big two-volume version was referred to as James, and the smaller, briefer edition is called Jimmy. That's what it was referred to. And there's another um, book called Talks for Teachers on Psychology, Uh, The Talks for Teachers on Psychology is indispensable. It's unbelievably uh, useful for for understanding uh, the basics of psychology and how it can be used in a practical way. All of these books that I'm referring to are uh, available online through archive.org, and I'll include that uh, link to those books in the description. William James was an incredibly articulate, intelligent, thoughtful, insightful thinker. He was referred to as the Pope of American psychology, whereas Wundt was the Pope of European psychology. Um, William James had the first lab, psychology lab, in the United States. He had the first psychology class at Harvard, and he created the psychology department at Harvard University. Incidentally, in his first class uh, teaching psychology at Harvard, he used Herbert Spencer's textbook on psychology um, and later used his own work in 1890, after 1890, his own textbook. It's interesting to note that uh, after writing uh, The Principles of Psychology, James gave up psychology. He decided to move on to philosophy, and uh, he felt that psychology had uh, was he had uh, he had explored psychology as far as he could take it, and wanted to to uh, broaden his approach to philosophy. Uh, when asked by a, a reporter why he would leave psychology when he was at the, the he was the top psychologist in the United States, why would he uh, just walk away from it? And James um, reportedly said, because only the Germans have the inability to become bored. 
and I'm not German. And this was a real um, dig at Wundt. And Wundt read uh, James's Principles of Psychology and regarded it as high literature, well-written, but not psychology. There was a real distinction between what James was doing with functionalism and uh, what the Germans were doing with, with um, an analysis of the elements of consciousness. By all measures, reading the textbooks of William James or later the psychology textbooks of John Dewey, um, it's clear that functionalism is a far more sophisticated and um, just a, a more intellectually precise and sensitive form of psychology than uh, either voluntarism or structuralism was. Uh, the, the functionalism is probably the closest we get to today's versions of a, con a combination of evolutionary psychology, cognitive psychology, and neuroscience. James grew up in New York City. He's the older brother of Henry James, the famous novelist, and William James' father was uh, independently wealthy. Uh, they grew up, James was born and grew up in the Hotel Astor, which stood in the uh, area down by the World Trade Center where, uh, in New York City, where um, the post office now is. There's a big post office building near the, the World Trade Center area, and um, there, there was a hotel there, and that's where William James was born and where he grew up. His father was uh, a bit of an eccentric. He was um, he wrote books on uh, a um, a Christian theologian named Emanuel Swedenborg, and Swedenborg was a mystic Christian. And um, uh, James's father was was very taken by this philosophy. You can actually find James William James's father's book, uh, Henry James Senior, on. The, uh, on Swedenborg, the mystical Christi Christianity on archive.org. It's available there as well if you want to check it out. Uh, but um, his father was very demanding. He um, felt that James should have the best education in the world, so William James spent some of his younger years in Europe, places like Switzerland and England and Germany, uh, studying at different schools and... Um, he had a variety of interests. He was a true interdisciplinary scholar. James wanted to be an artist, but his father uh, was very dramatic in responding to James' interest in being an, an artist. As a matter of fact, James moved to the family uh, cottage in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, to study art with a very famous American impressionist at the time, uh, J William James' father had a fit about this, the idea that James wanted to be an artist and uh, even threatened suicide if James would become an artist. Well, James was a, was a decent artist, but he realized that he didn't have the talent that um, would be needed to be a great artist, so he turned his attentions towards philosophy. In 1864, James enrolled at Harvard Medical School and he eventually took a degree in, in medicine, but he never practiced medicine. As a matter of fact, he limited his practice to, of medicine to helping out his students when they were sick. At that time, he lived near campus, and uh, if one of his students were sick in a, in a dormitory at Harvard, he would go, pay a visit with his medical bag and treat his students for free, but he never practiced um, as a physician for money. While taking a vacation um, in Germany, this was actually a, a health vacation, there was this phenomenon at the time called Americanitis. And Americanitis was kind of a, I guess today we would call it a, a state of apathy or a state of uh, malaise, a uh, general state of ennui that was experienced by uh, many wealthy people. Uh, James had this melancholia, this depression. He went to Germany, and he discovered the work of Wundt, and he was very excited about uh, Wundt's work, but it made him very depressed as well. Uh, combining Darwin's theory of evolution and the, the German uh, 
psychology that was eliminating the idea of free will, uh, stre stressing biological determinism of the physiologist, James fell into a deep depression, wondering uh, how he could how he could live a meaningful life if he had no control, if it was all biologically determined. Uh, he then came across the writings of free will by Charles Bernard Renouvier. And after reading the essay, James wrote this in his diary. I think that yesterday was a crisis in my life. I finished the first part of Renouvier's second essay and see no reason why his definition of free will, quote, the sustaining of a thought because I choose to when I might have other thoughts, end quote, need be the definition of an illusion. At any rate, I will assume for the present until next year that it is no illusion. My first act of free will shall be to believe in free will. Hitherto, when I have felt like taking a free initiative, like daring to act originally, without carefully waiting for contemplation of the external world to determine all for me, suicide seemed the most manly form to put my daring into. Now I will go a step further with my will, not only act with it, but believe as well, believe in my individual reality and creative power. We see the influence that Renouvier's essay had on William James. He claimed that his act, his first act of, of believing in free will was choosing to believe in free will. And this idea of choosing to believe in free will uh, holds great power and potency even today. Now, this was also around the time when the birth of pragmatism came to be. And what I want to tell you about pragmatism is this doesn't mean practical in the sense that something is practical, pragmatic, practical. Pragmatism is a theory of epistemology. It's a theory of knowing, of systems of knowledge. And it was very much uh, founded by C.S. Peirce, a very close friend of William James, who was living in Milford, Pennsylvania. And um, the idea of pragmatism, in a nutshell, goes something like this. We can have things that are true, but may not necessarily be real. In other words, there are systems of knowledge. There are things that we think about. There are ideas and those ideas work. They help us to understand theoretically. They help us to understand, make predictions, control, change, uh, phenomenon. And in these systems or these models are very true. They work. Whether or not they are real, there's, it loses its, its value. Realness is something that um, is, is not a part of the scientific endeavor. For example... Uh, maybe you have a ritual, some sort of ritual that you do. Uh, let's say it's praying, and before a test you pray. And this ritual of praying before the test helps you, in some ways, to do better on the test. Maybe it empowers you, maybe it calms you, who knows what the effect could be. But the act of praying, it is true, helps an individual take a test, perhaps. Whether or not there is a supernatural power that's intervening is not relevant to whether or not it is true. So in other words, the reality of it is separate from the truth of it. Now, if you can grasp this idea that something can be true without being real, maybe think of a child who uh, the parents put the little elf on the shelf during the holiday times, and uh, the, the child has certain beliefs in this elf on the shelf, and it has a true effect on the child. But the reality of the story about this elf on the shelf, uh, whatever the story is that goes with it, reporting uh, to the parents or to Santa, who, however this works, I, I don't know, but uh, the specifics of it, but there's no reality to it. We can't speak to the reality, but the effect that it has on the child is very true. Uh, we might even think of the placebo 
uh, when we the discussion of placebo effects, the difference between the true and the real. And that's really the core of pragmatism, that something is can be true without being real. Now, critics say, well, if everything could be potentially uh, true, then what's the basis of fact? And James responded to this, uh, that it, unlike uh, the, this, this scarecrow argument against relativism, he said that some things can be more true than others. In other words, there are better explanations and more effective theories than others, but that still doesn't make it real. So there's a distinction in pragmatism between the true and the real. What makes pragmatism, where the word pragmatism comes from, is this. If it works, it's true. Keep in mind that's different from something being real, or as we would, might use the, the word factual. You're seeing this is a very intellectual theory. It's a theory that uh, challenges us to, to really consider uh, the distinction between um, what we call fact as a universal versus something that is relative to a system of knowledge, to a, a set of structured beliefs that uh, that transforms information into knowledge. And of course, this comes from C.S. Peirce and was later developed by William James and John Dewey. Let's take the example of James' decision to believe in free will. When one believes in free will, that becomes the truth of their reality. And it has implications on their lives, on their life. It has implications on what they do, how they think, how they go about living. That's distinctly different from the individual who who chooses to believe in determinism, that genes or society dictates their behavior. The realness of either of these arguments is irrelevant to the truth that impacts the individual who holds the belief. In this way of thinking, the truth of free will far outweighs any potential reality of free will. You can try this experiment. In personality psychology, we, we often discuss the primary characteristic of an individual as either finding the world to be a welcoming place or an unwelcoming place. We could call this basic anxiety or basic fear. Karen Horn and I called this basic fear. Uh, and if you're an individual who feels the world is a hostile place, a place that's filled with danger and uh, you have to look out for number one. Consider how the your truth, distinctly different from reality, because not everyone holds this view of the world. Um, do an experiment if you hold this belief. If this is your truth, that you have to look out for number one, that uh, everybody's out, to, out for themselves, um, suspend that, bracket that out for a few days, for a week, and choose to view the world in a different way as a place where there are potentially aspects of people who will help you and who will be there for you and will will assist you um, that the world isn't and the, the so, your social world isn't a completely um, everyone for themselves kind of darwinian selfishness uh, and see how this changes your experience of the world. And maybe if you're an individual who's, who views the world as a, a place where people will help you and it's a welcoming place to you, um, maybe you do the opposite experiment. See the world as a dangerous place where everybody's out for themselves and see how that impacts your decision-making and your behavior. The point of this experiment is to really bring home uh, the difference between truth and reality and just how potent truths it are for uh, each of us and also the idea that uh, in different circumstances, different truths can be better than others. Now, James pointed out that the idea of using science as the basis of psychology, British empiricism, uh, French sensationalism, 
this this was the firm foundation of the German psychology, Wundt pointed out that if if psychology is a science, then necessarily it has to be deterministic. In other words, uh, we begin with a hypothesis. We then develop that hypothesis through challenging the hypothesis to a theory. And ultimately, what we find in science is lawful determinism. So we go from hypothesis to theory to law. It should be realized in psychology there are no laws. Uh, James pointed out that psychology in itself could not possibly be a deterministic science with the existence of free will. In other words, if you believe that psychology is a science, then you've eliminated the possibility of free will. Free will is the opposite of determinism, the opposite of society and uh, biology uh, combining or independently determining us. We have, we have environmental determinism. This is the idea that our, our circumstances, our socioeconomic status, our culture, our religious uh, indoctrination, etc., our education determine how we act, how we think. Uh, the biological determinism is the idea that somehow brain chemistry or genes or brain structures determine. Uh, that any talk of hardwiring is determinism. James said uh, psychology that is scientific necessarily has to be deterministic, and this has great implications for functionalism because functionalism uh, embraces the concept of free will as did pragmatism, and the humanists later uh, drew largely on James's ideas of radical empiricism. And the idea of radical empiricism is not limiting oneself to a narrow methodology or definition of psychology. The term science, if you look at the etymology, scientia, it means the acquisition of knowledge. To this day, in uh, Certain academic settings, German academic settings, there's uh, different divisions of, uh, of, of science and poetry and uh, theolo theology could be the theological sciences. This doesn't have anything to do with lawful determinism. It has to do with the acquisition of knowledge. And so we look at science in this spirit and we think of radical empiricism in James in this very spirit. Hi, this is Dr. Joby. Welcome to the continuation of our discussion of William James and American Functionalism. Here's a quote from William James' Principles of Psychology that should really illustrate the differences between Wundt and James. Within a few years, what one may call a microscopic psychology has arisen in Germany, carried on by experimental methods, asking, of course, every moment for introspective data, but eliminating their uncertainty by operating on a large scale and taking statistical means. This method taxes patients to the utmost and hardly could have arisen in a country whose natives would be bored. Such Germans as Weber, Fechner, and Wundt obviously cannot, and their success has brought into the field an array of younger experimental psychologists bent on studying the elements of the mental life, dissecting them from the gross results in which they are embedded, and as far as possible reducing them to quantitative scales, the simple and open method of attack having done what it can the method of patients starving out and harassing to death is tried. The mind must submit to a regular siege in which minute advantages gained m night and day by the forces that hem her in must sum themselves up at least into her overthrow. There is little left of the grand style about these new prism, pendulum, and chronography philosophers. They mean business, not chivalry. What generous divination 
and that superiority in virtue which was thought by Cicero to give a man the best insight into nature have failed to do, their spying and scraping, their deadly tenacity, and almost diabolic cunning will doubtless some day bring about. That's from William James, Volume 1, page 192 in the Principles of Psychology. And we see he's describing what he sees as a soulless, mechanistic, materialistic psychology uh, that has no regard for anything that makes human beings human. Um, so James would be no fan today of uh, the biological psychologies and the more deterministic, materialistic aspects of um, scientism, uh, biological determinism and psychology. Let's explore a few of James' ideas. Unlike the structuralists and the voluntarists, James was not convinced or supporting of the view that uh, consciousness was something we all shared uh, universally. Uh, every consciousness was an individual's consciousness. And in this way, we couldn't break up consciousness into elements, which was the project of, of Titchener's structuralism. Uh, we, we had consciousness, James describes it as a stream, and it was a personal consciousness. It was a consciousness that was specific to a given individual. Um, consciousness is continuous, and it can't be divided up for analysis, according to James. He says, let anyone try to cut a thought across in the middle and get a look at its section. The rush or the thought is so headlong that it almost always brings us up at the conclusion before we can arrest it. Or if our purpose is nimble enough and we do arrest it, it ceases forthwith to, to be itself. As a snowflake, crystal caught in the warm hand is no longer a crystal but a drop. So instead, the catching, the feeling of relation, moving to the term, we find we have caught some substantive thing. Usually, the last word we were pronouncing, statistically taken, and with its function, tendency, and particular meaning in the sentence quite evaporated. The attempt at introspective analysis in these cases is in fact like seizing a spinning top to catch its motion, or trying to turn up the gas quickly enough to see how the darkness looks. Here we see James highly critical of what uh, Wundt and Titchener both laid out as the fundamentals of an empirical psychology, and uh, I think we can say that it's also highly critical of some of the major schools of thought of contemporary psychology. So for James, not only is consciousness something that is personal and not universal and is something that's flowing and is uh, n not dissectable, you can't take consciousness apart into elements, it's also constantly changing. It's, it's flowing and constantly changing. Consciousness is not a static, stable thing that can be dissected into elements. For James, consciousness is also selective. It's not something that we are aware of everything in the environment. Uh, consciousness, like a flashlight, is directed, the beam is directed onto specific things that we attend to. Now we can see that this concept is, is similar to Wundt's ideas of voluntarism. And in reading uh, the words of James, one wonders um, if he would have had access to later writings of Wundt, um, how he would have uh, maybe saw that Wundt and his ideas of voluntar Wundt's voluntarism was very similar to this aspect of James's selective attention. And the most important feature of consciousness for James is that it's functional. Consciousness exists for a reason. It serves the, uh, the organism for survivability, for 
passing on the genes, all the things that we see influencing psychology through uh, evolutionary theory. Consciousness is something that is functions within the environment. Listen to James' own words. Consciousness, then, does not appear to itself chopped up in bits. Such words as chain or train do not describe it fitly as it presents itself in the first instance. It is nothing jointed. It flows. A river or a stream are the metaphor by which it is most naturally described. In talking of it hereafter, let us call it the stream of thought, of consciousness, or of subjective life. Now, for William James, what comes to be the human condition is largely built on habits. Uh, Listen to what James says about the habit. Habits alone is what keeps us all within the bounds of ordinance and saves the children of fortune from the envious uh, uprisings of the poor. It alone prevents the hardest and most repulsive walks of life from being deserted by those brought up to tread therein. It dooms us all to fight out the battle of life upon the lines of our our nurture or our early choice and to make the best of a pursuit that disagrees because there is no other for which we are fitted and it is too late to begin again. It keeps different social strata from mixing. Already at the age of 25, you see the professional mannerisms settling down on the young commercial traveler or the young doctor, or on the, on the young minister, on the young counselor at law. You see little lines of cleavage running through their character and tricks of thought and prejudices, the ways the shop, in a word, the ways of the shop, in, in a word, from which the man can by and by no more escape than his coat sleeve can suddenly fall into a new set of folds. On the whole, it is best he should not escape. It is well for the world that in most of us, by the age of thirty, the character has set like plaster and will never soften again. James is saying that how we view the world, how we think, the decisions we make, our habits that by the age of 30 are solidified, not very easily changed. Now, he did say that there were five maxims to follow in order to develop good habits and eliminate bad ones. And this is even after the age of 30. So thinking of the way we view the world, how we think of reality, how we what we view of our personality, our collection of habits, and how we can go about changing the habits that we wish to make different. The first, place yourself in a circumstance that encourages good habits and discourages bad ones. So in other words, the first thing to do if there's a habit that you want to change is take yourself out of circumstances that uh, promote that habit. Second, do not allow yourself to act contrary to a new habit that you are attempting to develop. Each lapse is like letting fall of a ball of string which one is carefully winding up. A single slip undoes more than a great many turns will wind again. So James is telling us that when we are starting a new habit, when we're ending an old habit, We have to really stick with it and not lose any ground with this habit, not even allow ourselves any any slack because it's like a ball of yarn. If we let it slip, we lose a lot of ground with even one uh, slip. He goes on, Do not attempt to slowly develop a good habit or eliminate a bad one. Engage in positive habits completely to begin with and abstain completely from bad ones. In other words, go to cold turkey. Uh, It is not the intention to engage in good habits and avoid bad ones that is important. It is the actual doing so. There is no more contemptible type of human character than that of the nerveless sentimentalist and dreamer who spends his life weltering in a weltering sea of sensibility and emotion, but who never does a manly uh, concrete deed. So in other words, don't talk about it, do it. 
<laughs> and finally, force yourself to act in ways that are beneficial to you, even if doing so at first is distasteful and requires considerable effort. So, in other words, it's going to hurt to make the changes. It's the sacrifice. Anyone who's ever uh, attempted to quit smoking or, uh, or restrict their, their intake in a diet or engage in exercise understands the uh, great deal of discomfort uh, and personal uh, discipline that it takes to displace an old habit with a new habit. And for James, it's all habits. William James' concept of personality is very broad. He, d he called the concept of me, myself, the empirical self. He said, in its widest possible sense, a man's me is the sum total of all that he can call his. Not only his body and his psychic powers, but his clothes and his house his wife and children, his ancestors and friends, his reputation and works, his land, his horses, yacht, and bank account. This is all the self. And, and James divided the empirical self into three components, the material self, the social self, and the spiritual self. So the material self consists of everything material that a person could call his or her, or her own, such as their body, the family, their property. The social self is the self as known by others. He said, a man has as many social selves as there are individuals who recognize him and carry an image of him in their mind. And the spiritual self consists of a person's states of consciousness. It's everything we think and also includes the emotions associated with our various states of consciousness. So the spiritual self then has to do with the experience of one's subjective reality. So the me, uh, the empirical self, is different from the I. Uh, the empirical self, the me, is the person is known by himself or herself. But there's also another aspect of the self that, that does the knowing. That's the I. And uh, James had a struggle with this, the self as knower, I-ness. He, he brought back to an older philosophical uh, notion of soul, spirit, or transcendental ego. So there's the I that knows me. There's a story that uh, James had been doing some kind of a drug, some kind of uh, hallucinogen. And uh, every time he took this... Uh, I think it was uh, nitrous oxide, he would come up with the uh, secret to life, and then he regretfully would forget it. So he decided to force himself to write it down. And when he woke up the next morning, he found this note written, Hygamus, hogamus, women are monogamous, hogamus, hygamus, men are polygamous. And uh, he felt that this summed up uh, the situation of the sexes. James also had a formula for determining uh, self-esteem. Uh, he said, with no attempt, there can be no failure. With no failure, no humiliation. So our self-feeling in this world depends entirely on what we back ourselves to be and do. It is determined by the ratio of actualities to our supposed potentialities, a fraction of which our pretensions and denominator and uh, the numerator are successes thus. So he said self-esteem was success divided by our pretensions. So in other words, it's our real self divided by our ideal self or what we'd like to believe about ourselves. Finally, let's take a look at William James' unique view of emotions. And this is a view that has great support uh, today, even in the um, most uh, empirical of psychologies. Uh, here's what James had to say in his own words. 
Our natural way of thinking about emotions is that the mental perception of some fact excites the mental affection called the emotion, and that the later state of mind gives rise to bodily expression. My theory, on the contrary, is that the bodily changes follow directly the perception of the exciting fact, and that our feelings of the same changes as they occur is the emotion. Common sense says, we lose our fortune, are sorry and weep. We meet a bear, are frightened and run. We are insulted by a rival, are angry and strike. The hypothesis here to be defended says that this order of sequence is incorrect, that the one mental state is not immediately induced by the other, that the bodily manifestations must first be interposed between and that the more rational statement is that we feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike, and afraid because we tremble, and not that we cry, strike, or tremble because we are sorry, angry, or fearful, as the case may be. Without the bodily states following on uh, the perception, the latter would be purely cognitive in form, pale, colorless, destitute of emotional warmth, We might see then a bear and judge it best to run, receive the insult and deem it right to strike, but we could not actually feel afraid or angry. It's very interesting because James, um, his proposal sounds a lot like um, what we find in Buddhist psychology and Eastern philosophy. William James, who wrote um, a massive book on the varieties of religious experience, felt that uh, the future of psychology, of Western psychology, would be looking towards the East. He uh, studied Buddhism and felt that the Buddhist concept of mind, Buddhist psychology, would in the future displace all Uh, reductionistic, mechanistic, and materialistic endeavors uh, uh, within psychology. And we're seeing now in the 20th and 21st century uh, that Buddhist psychology is becoming uh, more and more popular. Uh, And people in the West, uh, and students of psychology in the West, are uh, more and more turning towards uh, Eastern concepts of, of psychology, just as James had predicted.